You can be seated now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, Madam Chief Justice, Lieutenant Governor Tolan, statewide elected officials, members of the legislature, cabinet officers, leaders of the Kansas tribes, honored guests, and fellow Kansans. After two years of challenges, of limited gatherings, it is my high honor to stand before you once again this evening to deliver my fourth State of the State Address, to report on our shared successes, and to present a blueprint for the final year of my first term. Joining me tonight in the East Gallery is the third first gentleman in Kansas history, my husband, Ted Doughty. Ted's retired now from practicing medicine, but he did, during the pandemic, return to support our state's many dedicated health care professionals as they toiled to keep Kansans safe and healthy. It's also my pleasure to welcome my daughter, Kathleen Doughty, and her husband, my son-in-law, Matthias Wyden. And I welcome, virtually, my other daughter, Molly Doughty, who's watching online tonight. I also welcome and thank my cabinet secretaries who are seated behind me in the West Gallery. The COVID-19 pandemic brought challenges for every agency, and I could not have asked for a better, more prepared team. They have not only faced those challenges head on, but each of them has steered their agency to be more fiscally responsible, more nimble, more efficient, and more effective than ever before. And finally, it's my pleasure to welcome Lieutenant Governor David Tolan and Second Lady Beth Tolan to their first State of the State in their new capacities. Well, David took the reins as Lieutenant Governor last January after I appointed our former Lieutenant Governor, Lynn Rogers, to serve as our State Treasurer. Now, Lynn is a compassionate, hardworking, and dedicated public service. And he has been an absolutely fantastic treasurer. Lynn has already returned more than $5 million of unclaimed property to their rightful owners. Thank you, Lynn, for your leadership and your continued service. You know, for the past three years, Lieutenant Governor Tolan has worked tirelessly as Secretary of the Department of Commerce. He has spearheaded efforts to help small businesses weather the pandemic. He has rebuilt commerce programs to once again make Kansas competitive globally and nationally. I'm fortunate to have him by my side as we continue to put his economic development expertise to good use for Kansans and Kansas communities. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's not just my Lieutenant Governor and my Executive Cabinet who have gone above and beyond during this pandemic. All of you seated here are serving during a uniquely challenging moment in our state's history. And the work you're putting in the collaboration is helping Kansas turn the corner, paving the way for a more prosperous future for all who choose to call this place home. Needless to say, it has been an arduous couple of years for Kansas and the nation. We've lost loved ones, co-workers, friends, and neighbors. Unfortunately, we continue to lose too many Kansans to this virus. But we also saw and we continue to see 
the very best of Kansas rise up in every corner of our state. Our healthcare professionals have persevered, working long, hard hours for weeks, then months, then years. To save lives, they continue to be our heroes. And here with us tonight is one of our heroes, Whitney Friel, a charge nurse on the medical intensive care unit at Stormont Vale Hospital right here in Topeka. Whitney, could you please stand for a moment? Whitney and her fellow frontline workers have risked their own lives for nearly two years working around the clock to keep Kansans safe. Please know how grateful I am, how grateful Kansas is to you for your dedicated service. You know, in every corner of our state, ordinary people continue to do extraordinary things. The Kansas spirit of neighbor helping neighbor has never been stronger. The people of Kansas are getting back on their feet. The state of Kansas is getting back on track. However, right now, and likely for the next few months, the threat of COVID-19 remains, particularly for the unvaccinated and the immunocompromised. While the long-term outlook is much more positive with the new Omicron variant, our hospitals and nursing homes have sounded the alarm. Rising case numbers from the winter holidays in Omicron have created the toughest surge the medical community has faced since the pandemic began in 2020. Last week, I issued two new executive orders that create staffing flexibility to keep residents, patients, and staff safe. It will be imperative that we work together to quickly extend my orders through legislation to help our nursing homes and our hospitals. And for those of you watching at home, I ask that all of you think of your family, your friends, and our frontline healthcare workers. Let's help each other by getting vaccinated, getting your children vaccinated, and getting the third shot. This is how... <laughs> this is how... This is how you keep yourself healthy and those around you healthy. We owe this to one another. You know, folks, we are going to get through this. Since we began the fight against this pandemic, we've taken a clear-eyed, balanced approach, acting responsibly to stop the spread of the virus, while also ensuring that our Kansas economy grows and stays strong. And because we managed our budget responsibly and saw record economic growth and investment in our state, I'm now proud to say that we have the largest budget surplus in the past 40 years. That's, that's the largest surplus in 40 years, all while balancing the budget and fully funding our schools. You know, whereas just a few years ago, Kansas was making headlines for its budget mismanagement, I believe Kansas is now the most fiscally responsible state in the nation. We've paid down state debt and we're adding six hundred million dollars to the state's rainy day fund, the most money that's ever been put in there. <laughs> Growing the rainy day fund is the responsible thing to do to make sure critical services like schools and law enforcement are always funded, even if our economy takes a turn for the worse. Because we've managed the budget so responsibly, I was proud to announce that every working Kansan 
who file taxes in 2021 will get a $250 rebate this year, $500 for married couples filing jointly. That's money back in your pocket to pay for childcare, to take your family on a mini vacation, or to buy groceries. While we're on the topic of groceries, here's something we all know. Food in Kansas costs our families way too much. And even as we sit here with a record surplus, Kansans continue to pay higher taxes on groceries than anyone in the country. It makes no sense. For years, many of us on both sides of the aisle have been calling for an end to the state sales tax on food. Now, with this surplus in the bank and increased revenue because of our economic growth, we can finally responsibly afford to totally eliminate the grocery sales tax. I've called, I've called on the legislature to send a bill to my desk to end this tax once and for all. It will save Kansas families hundreds, perhaps thousands of dollars a year. This is a common sense policy on which Democrats and Republicans can completely agree. The only obstacle that could block this legislation is the same type of toxic political games that have poisoned Washington, D.C., where denying a political opponent a win has become more important than getting things done for the people they represent. We are better than that in Kansas. Let's not overcomplicate this. Let's not overcomplicate this. The essence of the bill can be summed up in 13 words. We hereby eliminate the state sales tax on food in Kansas effective immediately. Just 13 words. Send me a clean, bipartisan bill that eliminates the state sales tax on food and do it by Kansas Day. January 29th. I will sign it the moment it hits my desk. We must, we must not delay. Every day we delay costs Kansas families money each and every day. It will be a win for everyone in this room and much more importantly, a win for working Kansans. We all know working families need a break, particularly after the last two years. This pandemic has created so many strains, so many stressors, and so many challenges. We cannot let it derail the careers or the dreams of our young people. That's why we have remained laser focused to protect their futures. That meant upholding my promise to bring fiscal sanity back to our state government. It wasn't easy, and not a day has gone by that I haven't been tasked with making tough financial decisions. But our resolve to keep the state checkbook balanced is paying off in a big way. Today, I'm announcing that my budget includes a total freeze on college tuition increases. Well, you heard that right. No tuition increases whatsoever. The virus took something from our students, and we are going to give them something back. Again, it's a huge win for our young people and for all working Kansans. These are the types of things we can do when our state's economy is growing the way it is. And it is economic growth we should all be proud of. Look at where we are. We've created more than 30,000 new jobs. That's 30,000 even in a pandemic. 
Our unemployment rate has been below 4% for over a year. And in 2021 alone, the private sector invested nearly $3.8 billion in new facilities and equipment. That's, that's a new state record by a long shot. That means new businesses coming to our state, existing businesses expanding, big companies opening new divisions, smaller businesses hiring new employees. It means jobs for Kansans living in our cities, in our suburbs, and in our rural communities. Our small businesses are growing. Our big companies are hiring hundreds of new employees and expanding, like Hilmer Cheese in Dodge City, Superior Boiler in Hutchinson, and the Schwann's Pizza Plant in Salina. And big national companies, like Urban Outfitters, are choosing to build distribution centers here because we have a strong economy and the best workforce in the nation. You know, over the past three years, we have secured a total of more than $7.6 billion in new business investments in Kansas. That's more than any previous administration's total in the entirety of their first term, and we still have another year left. Remember several years back, Kansas was in the national news for all the wrong reasons. Well, in 2019, we were back in the national news, but this time as CNBC's comeback state of the year. And in 2021, Kansas was recognized with the prestigious Gold Shovel Award, a national award given to governors who lead the way in attracting job-creating investments to their states. There's more economic opportunity in the state of Kansas today than at any time in our history. And Kansas, Kansans themselves should really take pride in the role they have played in helping our state and all of the nation successfully navigate through this pandemic. Everyone here knows this. Kansas processes 25% of the nation's highest quality beef. If our meatpacking plants had shut down during the pandemic, it would have created a food crisis for our entire country. We really couldn't let that happen. So during those first days and weeks of the pandemic, I partnered with then Senator Pat Roberts, who was chair of the Senate Ag Committee. Together, Senator Roberts and I worked with President Trump to make sure our meatpacking plants stayed open safely. It wasn't about political party. It was about keeping Kansans who feed our nation and the world on the job. As a result, You know, as a result, Kansas was the only state in the nation to keep all of our major meatpacking plants open during the entirety of the pandemic. I'd like to thank our federal delegation, particularly Representative Sharice Davids and former Senator Pat Roberts, for their hard work in making that happen. After all, we know that the agriculture industry is the lifeblood of our economy, and farmers are truly the heartbeat of our state. Right now, our hearts go out to the Kansas farmers and ranchers who have lost their livestock, their crops, and even, in some cases, their own homes to wildfires. I want you to know that we're doing everything in our power to provide relief to restore your livestock and rebuild your farms, your ranches, and your lives. With us here tonight is Russell County Emergency Manager Keith Haberer. Keith, could you please stand for a moment?
Keith has been a firefighter and an emergency manager in Russell for more than 20 years. During the recent wildfires, I witnessed firsthand how hard Keith worked to help the people in his community stay safe. For weeks, he's been working nonstop. He coordinated the county's response to the raging fires and delivered resources to the families, farmers and ranchers who were impacted by the devastation. He is one of thousands of first responders all across our state, our firefighters, our law enforcement, our National Guard, and our EMTs, who step up when a crisis hits. Thank you, Keith, for your service to your neighbors and to your community. Our farming and ranching families are lucky to have men and women like Keith who stand ready to provide support when times are tough. This administration is equally committed to supporting our agriculture industry. Whether it's through being the only Democratic governor in the country to support the USMCA trade agreement, or responding to COVID-related challenges, or adding short-line rail projects to move product to market more costly and more efficiently. More, more cost-effectively is really what I meant to say. <laughs> but still, we know that farming isn't getting any easier, particularly with natural disasters and global supply chain challenges. But we also know our farmers and ranchers are the most resilient people on Earth. As I travel across Kansas, the stories I hear are so inspiring. Farmers like Vance, Louise, and That sense of pride so often passed from one generation to the next. That's what makes Kansas farmers so special. Now, looking ahead, I'm excited to share with you that my budget this year also restores full funding to the state water plan for the first time in 15 years. The water, plan, the water plan is a five-year blueprint for action that will ensure that we have a reliable, quality water supply to support not only the needs of Kansas communities, but a thriving farming economy. Because everyone knows in this room, as I do, that agriculture built the Kansas economy, and it will always be the backbone of our state. And despite all of the obstacles that our farmers and ranchers have faced, and thanks to their unrivaled persistence, Kansas is on its way to another record year of agricultural exports. In fact, we will surpass the $4 billion mark in exports for the second consecutive year, a feat not accomplished in nearly a decade. $4 billion, that is a big deal. You know, growing our rural economy has been a major focus of my administration. 
Our efforts to begin to rebuild our rural economy began day one when we established the Office of Rural Prosperity. We then moved expeditiously to restart the Kansas Main Street program to help our rural communities keep their downtowns vibrant. We cherish our main streets as the heart of our communities, the cultural centers of our communities, and as their economic drivers. And if we've learned anything these past couple of years about doing business in this day and age, it's that if you don't have access to high-speed internet, you're going to get left behind. When I got into office, Kansas was way behind the eight ball on broadband development. The state had no roadmap, no funding, and no plan. So we established the Office of Broadband Development, and now we have expanded internet access to over 50,000 new households and businesses. We've connected rural communities that were frustrated for years by the lack of access. During the pandemic, hotspots were strategically deployed to ensure that our students in low-income households could continue their education remotely. And we won't stop until every Kansan who wants or needs high-speed internet has access to it. For as much as rural Kansas, all of Kansas for that matter, needs a strong information superhighway, they also need better actual highways. You know, the type you drive on to get your products to market, or to get to work, or to get your kids to school. Sadly, for the past 10 years, politicians have taken money that was supposed to go for roads and bridges and instead used it to clean up the mess created by the tax experiment. The highway fund became known as the Bank of KDOT. Well, it's not a bank. It's been a slush fund. And this year, the slush fund goes away and the bank closes for good. We will, we will make sure that money meant for roads and bridges is actually used for roads and bridges. We have already completed numerous projects all across Kansas, and many others are in the pipeline. They're important projects, like the widening of US 69 from a two-lane to a four-lane expressway in Crawford and Bourbon counties. This project completes the much-needed, long-overdue four-lane highway from Kansas City to Pittsburgh a promise made years ago, and now a promise finally kept. Late last year, we announced design modifications in Johnson County for K-10 that will improve a stretch of highway serving 65,000 drivers per day. In Wichita, the state has partnered for several years with the city, the county, and the federal government to finish the $86 million North Junction project. When completed, it will, finally, alleviate Wichita's worst bottleneck. Every member of the Cedric County delegation sitting here tonight knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, new road projects like North Junction don't always create splashy headlines, but they do make our community safer. They do create jobs they do stimulate economic activity, and they change the very quality of life for residents who rely on these roads every day. And while we're on the subject of improving quality of life for the people of Kansas, we cannot forget about our healthcare systems and our hospitals. For years, we've debated Medicaid expansion, round and round. Medicaid expansion is the quickest and the easiest and the most common sense way to help Kansans. And we're not just talking about the 150,000 Kansans accessing quality, affordable health care. The fact is, communities can't grow or survive if their hospitals close. Kansas has lost five hospitals in recent years. We cannot afford to lose another one. We owe it to our rural families and to our businesses. 
Medicaid expansion won't just protect small towns and their residents. It will keep healthcare professionals from moving to neighboring states, most of which are red states, all of which have expanded Medicaid. Right now, we're the stubborn, self-defeating state in the middle of all of them. We are sabotaging our rural communities and their efforts to recruit new jobs and residents. We are shooting ourselves in the foot. Medicaid expansion is something we can do right now. It's well past time. Let's get this done. You know, a strong health care system will always be a hallmark of a healthy state and a healthy economy. Just as important, however, is the strength of our public education system. Four years ago, when I ran for office, I ran to be the education governor. After years of budget cuts and neglect, Kansas needed one. And now I'm proud to say that for the fourth straight year, we are fully funding our public schools. And we are doing it with a balanced budget, because it's not an either or. We can balance the budget while also funding our schools, fixing our roads and bridges, funding other essential services, investing in economic development. The full funding of our schools is something everyone in this chamber can celebrate. But I also know that for these past couple of years during the pandemic, the challenges facing our schools have gone way beyond just funding. Last year in my State of the State, I spoke directly to teachers who nearly overnight reinvented the way they taught, doing whatever it took to educate our children during the pandemic's worst days. We worked hard to get everyone back in the classroom, but the job of a teacher hasn't gotten any easier. If anything, it's more difficult and more stressful. Teachers have always deserved our deepest gratitude, our respect, and our support. So to all the Kansas teachers out there, we thank you and we applaud you. This year, I'd also like to take a moment to speak directly to Kansas parents, especially those with school-aged children. You have been through a whole lot these past couple of years, a whole lot. Now, I have two daughters, both well out of the house, thank goodness, but I often think about what it would have been if they were still young and had been at home during the pandemic. I know it would have been incredibly hard to balance their education and my job. It would have been hard dealing with their losses, not being able to hang out with their friends, not going to birthday parties, not participating in graduation ceremonies. And with this virus, particularly because it's gone on for so long, sometimes you feel like there's no right answer. When all you really want is to do right by your children, to have a voice, to have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. I want you to know that I've heard you. I have approached decisions I've made, not only as a governor, but also as a parent. I know with all the ways this virus has changed and keeps changing our lives, it can be difficult to keep up. This has been uncharted territory. This pandemic has deprived our kids of a normal childhood for far too long. That's one of the reasons why our Department of Wildlife and Parks, together with our Tourism Division, 
partnered with the State Department of Education to launch the Kansas Sunflower Summer Program. This program provided kids and their families the opportunity to visit all of our state's first-class attractions, our museums, our parks, our zoos, free of charge. In total, more than 70,000 Kansans participated in the program. In fact, Sunflower Summer was so successful that we have every intention to not only repeat it again next summer, but also to expand it. Our schools are now open, and they will stay open, but the Sunflower Summer Program helped make this uneasy time a little more manageable, a little more affordable, and a little more normal. Back in the classrooms, we also know that our kids are feeling the lingering effects of the pandemic. Not every parent has the means to help their children get the attention or the tools they need to fill the learning gaps created by the pandemic. Just yesterday, we announced a bipartisan agreement to allocate $50 million in learning recovery grants for students who need that extra help to get caught up. These grants will give parents the ability to sign their kids up for counseling, tutoring, summer camp, whatever their child needs to close the learning gap. We can't turn back the clock on the last two years, but we can lay out the path to support parents and put students in the best position to find success. You know, another thing on the minds of parents these days is not having to worry about their child's safety. I know I'm speaking for parents when I say that the world is a whole lot bigger and much more complicated than when we were growing up. We sense it as leaders as well, and I've made protecting children and helping them stay safe a top priority as governor. That starts by supporting our law enforcement officers. My budget contains historic levels of funding for law enforcement, funding that will provide better equipment, better training facilities, and greater public safety. And for our state highway patrol, a much deserved pay increase. We're also increasing funding for evidence-based juvenile delinquency programs so we can reach these kids before it's too late and keep them out of the system. There's no question, there's no question that as the world has changed, it has become harder to be a kid. From social media pressure to life during a pandemic, growing up in 2022, is a lot more complicated and difficult. Now imagine dealing with all that they have to deal with and what's happened over the last two years while also being a child in foster care. When I took office, our foster care system was a mess. It was an embarrassment, it was immoral, and it did not reflect how Kansans value and cherish their children. It wasn't going to be easy, but if I, I knew if we were going to create real accountability, that we would have to pull the curtain back and do a full, honest assessment of our foster care system and make the necessary and critical changes to protect our kids. And after three years, we have made significant progress. We have decreased the number of children in foster care by over 15%. That's 1,000 fewer kids in the system. Yeah, that, progress, that progress started with the tireless work done by Secretary Laura Howard and her team at the Department for Children and Families. They studied the mistakes of the past, and they took an intentional approach to move the state away from a child welfare system and toward a child and family well-being system. Secretary Howard directed the agency to focus on things like kinship care, 
where a child is placed with a family member or a very close family friend instead of being placed in the system. Kansas was also one of the first states in the nation to implement the Family First Prevention Services Act. This program provides support services for struggling parents to increase their ability to keep their children in their home rather than in the foster care system. You know, just last year, I signed an executive order creating the Division of Child Advocate. The Child Advocate will ensure that the progress we've made is not fleeting or subject to political manipulation. The Advocate will ensure an independent, accountable system to investigate complaints, to help families navigate a very complex system, and act as a data resource for further improvement of the system. But most importantly, the child advocate will make sure kids in our care are healthier and safer. The Division of Child Advocate has been a deeply bipartisan effort and would not have been possible without the support and input of legislators and stakeholders on both sides of the aisle. I know some of you here have spent years working to get this issue over the finish line, and I am grateful for your efforts. Likewise, an area where we should be able to find common ground is our state's mental health system. Whether we talk about our children or their parents, veterans or farmers, small business owners or healthcare workers, this pandemic has exacerbated mental health challenges for so many Kansans. That's why I've included additional funding in my budget to make it easier for local communities to provide critical mental health services closer to home and reduce the strain on our law enforcement agencies, our jails, and our hospital emergency rooms. It will save lives and it will protect our communities. I know many of you here care deeply about this issue and I look forward to working with you to create a mental health system in Kansas that's second to none. Now, speaking about second to none, as you all know, just last month, we lost our proudest native son, Bob Dole. Senator Dole was a passionate voice for Kansas. He was also a passionate voice for an entire generation, the greatest generation. In fact, it's because of people like Bob Dole that the greatest generation got its name. Senator Dole once told us, in politics, honorable compromise is no sin. It's what protects us from absolutism and intolerance. Senator Dole also said, when it's all over, it's not about who you were, it's about whether you made a difference. Now, these are words we should all keep close to our hearts, whether you made a difference. Now, if you only looked at social media, you'd think nothing gets done around here at all, just a bunch of bickering. But that's not the case. Thanks to the good work of the people in this chamber, I have signed 187 bipartisan bills. Let's look at the list a bipartisan bill to fully fund our public schools, a bipartisan transportation plan which will lead to 130 new infrastructure projects, a bipartisan scholarship program for our students in high demand, high skilled fields, a bipartisan bill that extends the tax credit program that helps Kansas startups succeed, a bipartisan bill to support our military families and encourage them to stay in Kansas 
a bipartisan emergency loan program to help families and businesses pay their utility bills when they skyrocketed last February. The list goes on and on. When we think back several years and reflect on why things in Kansas went so far in the wrong direction, it's because we weren't prioritizing what Kansans want and what they need. Kansans want their government to focus on the day-to-day -day needs that most of us can agree on, and not on the ideological issues or the culture wars that divide us. That means they want new businesses that bring good jobs, strong public schools, roads that don't wreck their car, safe communities, access to basic health care, a balanced budget, and when possible, and when responsible, tax relief to help working families. You know, when I talk to Kansans from all political parties in all corners of the state, the most common theme I hear is, I am so sick and tired of all the political fighting. And usually, they're not talking about the people in this building. They're talking about in their own lives. And the feeling that politics now dominates everything, the friendships that are being torn apart, social media feeds you're, feeds you're afraid to look at anymore, family members you can barely talk to, politics rearing its ugly head in our children's schools. I'm sure all of you in this room can think of people in your lives who just a few years ago, you could have a civil conversation and talk about the issues of the day and now you really can't. It's all become so toxic. Now the people in this chamber didn't cause this problem. Much bigger forces are in play. But the people in this chamber can be part of the solution. We can turn down the temperature. We can be civil and compromise. We can be role models for our children. We can put allegiance to Kansans ahead of allegiance to political party. We can be as good and as decent as the people who sent us here. Now, some of you may know that I am a baseball fan. And one of the great joys of my life was spending a day 20-some years ago with the great Buck O'Neill at the Negro League Museum. Buck was an iconic player for the Kansas City Monarchs, but his larger contributions to baseball and to this country came in his later years when he led the campaign to establish the Negro League Museum. He did it to make sure we never forgot those players, the injustices they faced, and their rightful place in history. Buck passed away about 15 years ago at the age of 94. Just a few weeks ago, we learned that Buck was posthumously voted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame to finally be honored alongside the game's very best. Long overdue, in my opinion, and it's a shame he wasn't alive to see it. But Buck was an eternal optimist, even toward the end of a life that had had so many hardships. One of Buck's more delightful sayings was, hold hands with the person next to you. That way, they can't get away, and neither can you. So let's all hold hands these next few months and not let go until we get things done. God bless our great and beloved state of Kansas. Thank you and good night.
Welcome to the Kansas House, the People's House. I'm Ron Reichman, and it's my honor to be with you tonight to provide the Republican response to the state of the state. First, I want to thank the governor for her remarks and for joining us in the House chamber for this annual address. Republicans have been focused on many of the same goals the governor talked about tonight. While we sometimes disagree on how to achieve these goals, my hope is we can always disagree in the spirit of cooperation and civility. However, it's not enough to talk about our goals. Your elected officials must deliver for you, for our families, for our future. Unfortunately, many of the promises we heard tonight do not align with the governor's record. The governor says she wants to reduce the sales tax on food, but she vetoed the plan to do just that. The governor says she wants to spend one-time income tax relief to Kansans, but a year ago, she blocked Kansans from meaningful income tax relief in order to feed government spending. The governor says she wants to foster economic growth, but she closed small business and she vetoed a plan to offer them the recovery loans they needed to weather the closure. In just two years, Governor Kelly has vetoed property tax relief for our families. The governor blocked a scholarship plan so that more of our young people could afford the education they need to enter the workforce. She's vetoed protections of our Second Amendment rights. She has opposed efforts to preserve our culture of life that Kansans have upheld for generations. She's attempted to drive up debt by mortgaging the public retirement fund. And the governor used Kansas's money to pay out millions of dollars in false unemployment claims to overseas fraudsters. Many Kansans say they have grown tired of broken promises. Listening to your concerns, your priorities, Republicans are focused on a different approach. An approach that will responsibly ratchet down the sales tax not only on food, but on everything else our families need to buy. Take a save more instead of a spend more approach, resisting the temptation to overspend one-time federal dollars. Stabilize the CAPERS retirement fund so that our teachers, our firefighters, and other public employees know it will be there for them when they need it. Continue to invest in mental health so that our children, our veterans, and our families can access services when and where they need them protect access to safe, reliable water sources for our families and our farmers. Preserve the Kansas culture of life so that the common sense protections like parental notification and safety requirements remain in place. Borrowing from President Eisenhower's words, the proudest thing I can claim is that I'm from Kansas. Whether you were born here or adopted Kansas as your home, we all have a deep rooted love for our state. It's a state where the American dream is still reality where a kid like me from a small town like Meade can grow up and serve in the legislature, where my kids and your kids can grow up and be anything they want to be. As Republicans, we pledge to keep that promise alive through smart economic decisions that don't drive up debt, through meaningful tax cuts instead of small one-time handouts, through steady leadership that will keep businesses and good paying jobs in our communities instead of forcing them closed. Together, I know we can keep the American dream, the Kansas dream, alive and well. May God bless you, and may God bless the great state of Kansas.